Join us as we showcase the remarkable journey of Indian fintech startups and their global impact. Explore how homegrown fintech solutions are revolutionizing financial services, not only domestically, but also on an international stage. Gain insights into the unique challenges and opportunities faced by Indian fintech entrepreneurs as they navigate the global market space. Discover the secret ingredients behind their success stories and learn how they are shaping the future of finance worldwide. I would be delighted to call on stage for this next session. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please request you to kindly settle down before we begin our next session, please. We would like to request you to kindly take the discussions outside. Uh, my request is... Uh, okay. My request is if we could all settle down uh, to everyone, it's very, very difficult to us to start. Let's just settle down, please. Let's just settle down. This space is not for card sharing, guys. This is not the space for card sharing. <laughs> I am sorry for that, but it is what it is, right? We are running very, very tight shift. We are trying to ensure everybody ends on time. So, Thank sorry, you, sorry Mr. Samir Singh Jayani. Ladies and gentlemen, for this next session, I would like to invite our speakers. Mr. Sabisachi Goswami, CEO of Perfios, and Mr. Samir Singh Jaini, founder and CEO of The Digital Fifth. Okay, uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, maybe uh, you would have read that report or you have seen report or launch of that. We'll be talking about enterprise fintechs, uh, which are growing a lot. Globalization is a key theme we have here. So fintech made in India for the world. I think it's a crucial, crucial activity. Uh, for long, we were always dominated by our platforms coming from another country and saying, okay, jo bhi angrez banate ho, sahi banate hai, copy kar lete hai, right? Uh, so that was always the case for us for a very long time. And now we are seeing an upsurge uh, in how Indian companies are doing it. So maybe before we go deeper into the story, um, let's, uh, Sabe, if you could would, uh, uh, quickly get a view on a bit of history of Parfios, uh, because you always talk about what's new. But how, how has been the journey and, and in terms of uh, how you became the leading B2B player in the, in the market, right? So quick journey will be useful for us to understand. Sure. Um, I thought most of uh, the people out here would know uh, how we have been doing. But let me still take a moment to explain. Um, so we, we started the journey way back uh, about one and a half decades, 15 years. Uh, and. When we started, we, we started as a consumer company, so B2C. The product lines were addressing the B2C. Uh, but soon we realized that uh, that's where uh, we can build a lifestyle business, but not a business uh, which can be sustainable for long. Uh, not demeaning anyone who is on the consumer side, but that's what our realization was. But anyways, we invested enough time uh, at that point in time, which went on research, and hence, we felt that it's better that we switch gears and whatever we kind of created at that time, using the same framework, can we create something for B2B? And that's where we shifted to B2B. Uh, thankfully, the situation was such where it was fresh out of subprime 2008. Uh, people across the globe uh, were shattered. The financial institutions were looking for three clear things, at least in the space that we operate in. How do we build a quality book was the first question in every, every financial institution's mind. Second was while doing that, how do you keep your credit cost low? While doing the above two, the third point was to give a seamless customer experience. Now that's a little bit contradictory, I understand that, but that's what was the expectation if you go back in 2008, 9, 10. And that's where we started our journey as well. So we quickly kind of reviewed everything that we were doing, went back to the financial institutions. Some were progressive, willing to experiment with us. And the journey started. Today we are here where we have completely helped the financial institution digitally transform in a lot of ways. Uh, we don't take the full credit, but yes, we did a large part of it where you see today most of the financial institutions are. No, I, I agree. I think uh, generically, uh, it's become a category builder, right? So, yeah. you have, I mean, when you think about it, it's perfumes or perfumes equivalents, right? I think uh, that's always the case. And 
and from a from a uh, uh, what do you say trust side i think we've seen a dramatic different uh, approach to you and others right so yeah. brilliant stuff uh, maybe uh, since we are talking about you or uh, in companies entering uh, global um, maybe what would be your what is your strategy of global uh, and uh, how do you approach different markets because regulations are different processes are different uh, there's always a context in the way you sell uh, maybe the way you are regulated. So, what's your framework of entering other markets and what temporary would you want to do uh, to give to others because a lot of you, them are also trying to out, go outside India. Yeah. So, I would wonder what are, why I would want to give a cookie cutter approach to this which product, which market because it is not like that. If people are thinking in the room that there is some real cookie cutter approach, it doesn't work. But I would like to give some first principles which we followed and I feel it works it should work for all of you out here. The first principles, the first one being uh, watch out for the regulatory compliance. If you thought our regulator is tough and strict, so do any other countries. So the first point that one has to watch is the regulatory compliance and I feel, uh, I mean I wouldn't hesitate to say more than product benefits if you are really, really strong on compliance is when you should look out for any market because the first thing that in our experience the client would want to understand and would really want to test are the compliance and, and it is not about talking how compliant you are, you have to demonstrate the compliance really in your product. If it passes that is when they will even test, that's the first validation. The second is the culture. Somehow we feel that they accept Indians, it is good in a public forum to talk about it but nobody likes foreigners so well and we are foreigners in other countries, right? So they would expect that there is a local presence who will interact with them during their need. So you should be a phone call away to come and be there with them, that's the second thing. That means it requires a lot of investment on day zero where you don't have a line of sight of any client, any sale and you don't know how long it will take. So it's a significant investment even before you have any anchor client. Third, the understanding of the market itself. A client meaning one or two client accepting your product doesn't mean it resonates with the broad audience of the entire market. It's a false trap that you are falling into, okay? It's a clear trap. The reason I'm saying it is while we are present in about 18 countries, people may not know how many countries we have stayed away from. We got a lot of inbound calls, you are doing this, why not? But when we went and did a lot more deeper dive and validations, we found Either our products are not suited for those countries where we can solve their problem in entirety, number one. Number two, there is not enough demand. So one client saying, I love your product is not a market, is not a market definition, right? So I think these three or four first principles is where I would like anybody who would, from India would want to venture outside should focus on. No, it's good. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about the challenges, right? One we go through and go through, but typically what challenges you really faced on the ground and uh, from an interpretation perspective, uh, what would you sort of take back saying, ye kar sakte the? so thoda sa practical aspects will be useful. Because I'll be honest, uh, when I don't even want to work or go outside the country because it's dar lagta hai, expense hota hai, uh, and the predictability is not there and consistency is not there. So maybe one or two critical lessons for everybody to pick up. Okay, so I, I, I think you need to have a strong uh, revenue build up in some other place or some other lines which can sustain your investment for long okay. when you are expanding geographically. Because as I said, your investment is on day zero without a line of sight when the first client will convert mm. and how long it will take to implement and the market to overall come and love your product. That's not happening soon. In my view, at least half a decade is what it takes to invest 
and become a strong player in any other market. Good that I'm not trying then. Anybody who thinks it's going to happen in 12 months, it's a trap. It takes a lot of investment, time, effort, money, whatever you call it. Ultimately, it boils down to putting the capital out there versus some other choices that you have. So, unless you have something else to sustain for that long, not a wise thing to do. I think that's one of the biggest challenges. The second, as I said, you cannot think that there are no regulations or lighter regulations or easier regulation or compliance is okay. You have to demonstrate compliance because you are a foreign company in that local land. You have to demonstrate. Demonstrate means you have to understand that market itself. To understand itself, you have to make enough investments, it's tying up with the first point. So, are you willing to do all of that? And for that, you have to be out there on the ground. Again, that means investment. So, if you are willing to do all of that, then it is. And we did not, I mean, I'll be very honest here, we did not anticipate so many things. We thought it will be easy. No, it is not. It has taken time. Fair, fair. Uh, I think we always talk about product market fit. Now, figuring out product market fit, first you have to figure out the country and then the product and market fit out there. So, where do you feel are the best countries or best markets? And markets, generally saying Southeast Asia is also very generic, right? Uh, there are so many countries and there are so many uh, local uh, flavors to it, local products. So, which countries which should, the, should people target and what products are the ideal suited for expansion to those countries? So, I, I think it ties back to my uh, the previous answer is that there is no cookie cutter approach that I would ask anyone to follow. No specific market or no specific product market fit. There has to be first principles and the context. So, it depends on your product line and have you studied enough on that market. One client does not define a market. Follow those first principles. Have you understood the regulation, compliance and the key requirements? Is your product capable to demonstrate one, two, three, the key requirements, the compliance, the regulations? If yes, that market is good for you. If one of your product is able to demonstrate that, that then that product suits you. So, there is no specific that this market is good. What is good for me may not be good for somebody else because I have a product which suits a particular market. Like I'll, I'll case in point here. So, we, we all, of, all of you would know here we, we largely serve the entire BFSI space and help them digitally transform. So, typically from a lending use case, when we have built products, we have built the products which are segment agnostic, industry agnostic, geography agnostic. Having said that, there are local nuances which we had to add, right? Now, I'll, I'll one case quickly uh, that I would present here, uh, Malaysia, uh, mid-sized developed economy, 35 million population, uh, banks are decently mature and evolved. Having said that, they were struggling to solve the SME landscape problems which India also not that we are doing great job, of course we are better than them, but there are still issues. So, our inside solutions in India which is loved, we went with that, we gave it to them. They loved it, they could reduce not only their timelines, they were taking three weeks, they brought it to three days. About 70 to 80 percent uptake that they saw. Internally they tell us they saw about 50 to 60 bips of benefit on their NPA side because the silent frauds what was happening has stopped. During COVID, the government of Malaysia introduced that because 70 percent of the population relies on the SME, the workforce is working with SME companies, they said that your adoption SME has to go up and thankfully the banks were working with us, they have adopted the solution. So, it is the right timing, the right product, all of that. So, it has a context. What works for me may not work for somebody else. That's how people should think. I agree. I agree. There's nothing to copy paste. India may not be able to do it, so very tough. Even in, within regions, you have a challenge, right? So, maybe I'll pause for a minute and uh, take some questions as well, uh, if you have any for Sabya. Anything from how to build a B2B companies to anything else uh, which you have in your mind. Anybody has any question here? Okay, 
So uh, in a very ideal case, uh, I mean, from, from a revenue perspective, if somebody is building outside, uh, what kind of revenues they can target, right? I mean, uh, it's a journey in itself. Uh, and uh, if you have an argument by the cash cow here, how do you optimize? Because how do you get that return over a period of time? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a nurturing game, right? Even if you reach a maybe 5% revenue in that market, that may not be uh, scalable enough and maybe remunerated enough. So how do you do this balancing act? Because now you're multiple countries and you have product coming out here, maybe your revenues are X here and then Y. So how do you optimize? How do you see each country as a proper PNL and make it independently profitable at what point in time? So how do you visualize country by country, product by product, uh, profitability? So I think the Sorry. I, I think the first thing that I said is you need to really invest in the first few years because you don't know, you don't have a client and you have to deal with so many uncertainties when you are exploring outside India. Uh, you already should have a uh, regular revenue line here for you, allowing you to expand outside. Second, uh, I would say that, of course, on day one, if you start looking at country-wise p &L, it will be difficult to diversify. So you shouldn't do a country-wise p &L in the first two years. Okay. But post-24 months is where you should start looking at country-wise p &L. Ideally, the mix for an Indian company, a decent-sized Indian company when they are expanding outside, I would say a 75-25 or a 70-30 is a right mix from a top-line perspective. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what one can aim at, but it's not coming soon. I said it's half a decade. Okay. Uh, one more question. So, uh, when you go to Middle East and some of the other countries, they have respect for products coming from uh, Western countries. Typically, if you go to uh, Southeast Asia, there is more respect for Chinese companies. So, do you see that uh, brand India is getting built? Uh, definitely. That has changed, Samir. I can very well vouch for that. Uh, India, from a digital landscape perspective, is well respected across the globe, not only just this, I meet enough people from very, very developed uh, economies, they also respect us. So when you go to ASEAN market or Middle East or Africa, they are half a decade to a decade back. And when we go with our products and technologies, they are absolutely receptive. What they don't like is, as I said, as a culture, we are still a foreigner. So we need to give them that trust that we are a company out there, teams out there, understand their culture, will be a phone call away. That doesn't go. Brilliant. With, with, I think with this we end, maybe just one last question. Yeah, uh, just uh, one question. Uh, going outside India, do you think it's more of the mindset? Because when we look like a like lot of uh, companies, I'm talking about the listed companies, uh, there are few companies in the uh, product spaces, where uh, some companies have, uh, from the initial space itself, they always try to go abroad, and some companies, like, they were happy operating in India itself. So do you think it's a more of the mindset uh, that the product you are building has to be suitable for the uh, international markets. So, what is that some people are just not able to go outside India? No, it, it used to be there again. I mean, if you see, actually India is the sweetest spot. Uh, people call it sweet po uh, spot. I say sweetest spot. And the reason I say it is, we are the fastest growing economy today, right? I mean, after the China issues, the geopolitical issues, every investment is happening in India. Look at the developed economies, US will grow at 2, 2.5%, 2.4% to be precise. India will grow at 7%. So there is no reason, rhyme and reason to go outside India. Why you go outside India is that you are diversifying. You definitely get an arbitrage, right? Whatever you will earn in INR versus what you get in dollars. People may call out, people may hate it, but that's what it is. Who will not love it earn in dollars? But, as I said, the dollars is a future distant reality, first is investment. As far as you are willing to make that. That's how it is. Thank you. I think with this we pause. Moka diya tha maine. So baat karte hain. Ab offline le lijega. I think naam bolke glimp, right? Okay, baat karte hain. So thank you with this and uh, super session. Thank you, thank you, Sabhya, for this. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goswami. Thank you, Mr. Jaini.